Generations Debates. Uh, my name is Luke Melfast, I'm a Research Fellow at the Initiative and I'm filling in tonight uh, for Dr Oliver Hartridge, uh, Executive Director who is in Australia this week. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to give a big thanks to the Friedlander Foundation uh, for their very generous support uh, for these debates. Uh, without it, this tournament would not have happened. We would also like to thank uh, EY for sponsoring this massive, uh, this magnificent space this evening. Now, the aim of the next generation of debates is to get people, particularly younger people, uh, thinking, talk, and talking about public policy issues, debating them, and understanding why they matter. And this, of course, dovetails nicely with the New Zealand Initiative's mission, promoting sound public policies uh, to make a better standard of living for all New Zealanders. So the debate tonight is the culmination of six preliminary debates uh, around schools around New Zealand and two hard-fought semi-finals last week. Uh, the topics have ranged from subjects such as working for families is a waste of money to should school zoning be abolished to asking whether or not national parks should be mined. The move for the grand final tonight that you are, if you are young and ambitious, you should leave New Zealand. Uh, by virtue of coin toss, Auckland will be a firm. Now, I should hasten to add that the move is designed to make for good debate, and it's not necessarily the view of the New Zealand Commission. <laughs> but of course, we do take an interest in these sorts of issues, and over the past few years, perhaps even up to the past decade, there's been few bigger issues around uh, than Kiwi migration to Australia and further abroad. Uh, let me just make a few brief points. Now, some 15% of Kiwi graduates live abroad, uh, yet, according to New Zealand immigration, we have skill shortages in just about every area except that of communications graduates. <laughs> New Zealand has the biggest educated uh, diaspora in the developed world after Ireland. Uh, internationally, obviously, we export a very high proportion of graduates, in particular abroad. Now, our living standards, as measured by the OECD, have fallen precipitously from being in the top couple in the 1960s uh, to being 20th in the world today. And of course, there are the obvious points, such as New Zealand is small, geographically isolated, and one way we market scale, mass migration, tends to be electorally unpopular. But then again, maybe it's not the income and the opportunities uh, that matter. Perhaps it's the attitude of New Zealanders that some people don't like. Maybe, as one person put it to me, New Zealand is just a nation of sad sacks. <laughs> but in an article today's Don Post, countering that would be the prediction uh, from a couple of economists that inward migration uh, back to New Zealand, and I think particularly from Australia, is going to get to about 20,000 uh, within a year, uh, thanks to mainly the reversal of the drone from Australia. So, on that note, I'd like to introduce tonight's speakers. Uh, from the University of Auckland, we have Joshua Baxter and Paul Smith. Uh, Joshua Baxter is the president of the University of Auckland Debating Society. He was on the New Zealand Schools Debating Team, which travelled to Qatar in 2010. He has been a quarter finalist at the World Universities and Australia Asia Debating Competitions. He is in his fourth year of the Law and Arts Conjoint, majoring in Philosophy. Uh, the second speaker is Paul Smith. Uh, Paul completed a BA in History, Politics and Philosophy at Victoria University and is currently studying honours in philosophy at Auckland. Uh, as a debater, he has twice been a semi-finalist at the Australasian Inter-University Debating Championship and attended the World Championships in Botswana in 2009. In New Zealand, he has previously won NZ and Pongchu champs and was a finalist this year. He has twice been a finalist at the NZ Prepared Champs and was a guest speaker at that tournament in 2008. He has won the NZ British Parliamentary Champs in 2009. <laughs> <laughs> Representing the Victoria University of Wellington are Asher Emanuel and Jody O'Neill. Now, uh, Asher is a fourth year student at Victoria University, studying English Literature and Law, and has been three times winner of the Officers' Cup for impromptu debating, and twice winner of the Joint Scroll for prepared debating. He has also been a semi finalist at the Australasian InterVarsity Debating Tournament. The second speaker is Jodie O'Neill, who is in her fourth year at Vic, studying towards a government degree in Law and Political Science. She is the president of the Victoria University Debating Society and has represented Victoria at numerous domestic and international tournaments over the years. In the past, she has won both the 
New Zealand prepared impromptu debating championships and was named best speaker at the NZ Impromptu Champs. Our adjudicators tonight are Christopher Bishop, Gareth Richards and Sebastian Templeton. Uh, Chris is a senior advisor to the Honourable Stephen Joyce. Gareth Richards is a barrister with Star Street and Sea Chambers. And Seb Templeton is a solicitor with Chapman Trip. Uh, all are former university debaters and we're very, very grateful for their expertise and assistance tonight. Now, the format of tonight's debate will be as follows. Each speaker has seven minutes. There will be a balance at six and seven minutes. Each team has a four minute right to reply with bells at the third and fourth minute mark. Uh, points of information will not be taken. And to discuss the debate uh, immediately post, we are very privileged to be joined by these panellists this evening, uh, Stephen Franks and the Honourable Peggy Barata. So with, without further ado, I would like to welcome the first speaker from the University of Auckland to affirm the note that if you are young and ambitious, you should get out of New Zealand. I've already been introduced as a fourth year law student. And I'll tell you a fact. When I graduate, as soon as I can get a job somewhere else, I'm going to do it. And the reason is that I, like many people in this audience, want to get the best job possible. I want the best salary possible. I want to experience a new culture that I simply cannot get here. One day, I'll probably come back and marry and have children, like most people who decide to go overseas and come back and set up a life. In this audience, I see a group of people in a very similar predicament. Our, our message to you tonight is this. Do it. Go make the most of yourselves and one day come back. We think the opportunities for you overseas are far better than the ones that you can get here. What will we talk about? First, about what ambition means. Second, about why career opportunities are better overseas. And thirdly, about how uh, there are better experiences that everyone should aim to get from living overseas. Paul, at second, is going to discuss uh, how this benefits New Zealand when our people leave and eventually come back. So let's, look at, let's talk about ambition. Too often, ambition is an ugly word that people use to describe people as being some sort of negative thing. But the truth is that wanting to do well for yourself is the aim in, get in the game of life. People want to have a better lifestyle. They want to make their lot the best possible. Because they're young and ambitious people have a lot to offer the world. But the world has a lot to offer them. We think that it's totally legitimate for people to leave New Zealand and one day come back. We think that's only part of what it means to be human, to decide to buy a big house or work as hard as possible and raise children rather than giving all your money away to someone else. We think that part of that just means that if it's better for you to go overseas, people should do it. We don't think that people have some sort of obligation to New Zealand to stay here, to improve it all the time at the, at the personal expense of them. We think it's totally legitimate for people to go overseas experience and get the most out of themselves. And if they help New Zealand in the process, that's fine. But we don't think that people at all have some sort of obligation, some sort of tie to this country that means they can never leave. So what can someone get out of going overseas? Let's look first at the career opportunities overseas. We think that going abroad will help your career. Let's look at salaries. If you're a junior doctor in New Zealand and you've worked for a few years, you can go to Ireland or Western Australia and double or triple the amount you'll get paid in this country. You'll pay back your student loan in half the time. You will get money that will allow you to come back here and buy a house and raise a family. You should do that. We think that young people should, should actually act on that and earn the most they can. The same is true for a lawyer who's worked for two or three years who can earn double at a, at a corporate law firm in the Magic Circle firms in Britain or in the White Shoe Law firms in New York. The same is true for a construction worker or an engineer who wants to leave this country and work in the Australian mines and get paid a lot more money. The truth is that salaries are better somewhere else and it's legitimate to go and earn that money and come back and start again. We think that's what part of being the Kiwi dream is, that we think that ambitious people should try and get the best salary they can. But this debate's not just about salaries. Look at the other career opportunities people get. For instance, right, John Key could not be the head of the Forex division of Merrill Lynch if he had done that from, from Willis Street. Right? That just could not have happened. The truth is that sometimes you need a high concentration of people and experience to be at the top of your game. Because the best apps, some of them are probably developed from some apartment on Willow Street, but most of them come from the Silicon Valley and the San Francisco Bay. 
We're a group of entrepreneurs who bounce ideas off each other, work, from, work together, and train together, and get better together, make an industry that if you want to be the top in your game, you have to go there and experience it. That is the kind of career opportunities that New Zealanders should aim to get. You shouldn't be stuck in our little corner of the world rather than using the skills that you have to offer the world to make yourself better. We think it's a self-limiting option if you're the top of your career to stay in this country when you could go somewhere else and make, and make the world better and improve yourself. But also, these people learn the kind of skills they bring back. Paul's going to talk to you more about this later. But take, for example, Rob Fife, the former Air New Zealand CEO. We say so many New Zealand business people have gone overseas because they needed to do that to get the skills to run a big country, a company. For instance, right, if you work in a multinational and they give you an MBA and they pay for that and they give you the best training, that can only be good for you to take it and to get those skills and come back one day. We think climate space is just better for people to take that opportunity where, they, where, where it's been offered to them and when they come back, they benefit the country. And Paul will talk about that more. But this debate isn't just about money, unfortunately. It's also about experiences. And there are certain experiences you just can't get in New Zealand. Ambitious people don't just want the most money, they also want to experience the best that culture has to offer them. They want to understand a different way of life. They want to immerse themselves in the pool of world experiences. And you're only young once. When you're young is the best time to take an OE to Europe or to New York. It's the only point in your life where you can float and experience new things. Would you rather, okay, question, would you rather uh, live across the road from Westminster Palace or be, or be across the road from the confused concrete monstrosity that is the beehive? It may sound, it may sound like a dumb question, but that is, that is in, in simple terms the question that we ask young people. Sometimes it's legitimate to go overseas and immerse yourself in a different culture, experience new people, live in a, in a bustling metropolis and gain the skills you want and live the life you want. That is a legitimate decision for people to make and it's a time-honored Kiwi tradition to move away from our tiny corner of the globe and experience culture somewhere else. Because in New Zealand, over the past 10 years, the biggest cultural phenomenon we've had is the next minute catchphrase. We say that if you, if you like Wellingtonians, if you like Cuba Street, go to Spain because it's one bigger, better Cuba Street. It is, it, is, it is totally legitimate for people to want to experience a different culture, immerse themselves in that, and grow as people and experience from those uh, experiences. Young, ambitious people should seize that opportunity and go overseas. It's about money, of course. It's about earning a better salary. It's about getting the best you can and working the best part of the industry you're the best in. But it's also about gaining something that you couldn't gain from staying in New Zealand's wilderness forever. Because while that's very nice, it's not the be all and end all. We say to you all, if you're young and ambitious, leave New Zealand and get the most you can. The motion stands. Thank you. I once came from there. I know that life is short, brutish, and nasty. <laughs> Down here, one we believe in something a little bit bigger than salary, a little bit bigger than the individual. We believe in something called the community. And accordingly, we think that ambition works on a much larger scale than just yourself. It works on a much larger scale than just Josh or just I. So I want to talk about three things this evening. First of all, I want to make a moral case for why you should reinvest yourself. We, as young people, should reinvest ourselves right here with the people who invested so much in us. Secondly, I want to make the case that the character of opportunity in New Zealand is, even if it's different to overseas, much better for a young person who actually wants to make big change in this world. And then thirdly, I want to talk about how there's just a fantastic, what we'll call, lifestyle dividend, namely features that you just can't get anywhere else in the world. But before we do that, let's have a look at Josh's case. Let's just say we're going to accept the premise right at the beginning that Josh could get a job overseas. <laughs> <laughs> but he claimed four things. He said, I really want to experience a fantastic new culture. I want to float uh, and travel around the world and see Spain because it's better than Cuba Street. Ladies and gentlemen, that's just the case for doing your OE and periodically going around the world to experience new things, to refresh yourself and make sure that your viewpoint doesn't come too narrow. It doesn't necessitate that you move away. And it's not likely that Josh is going to, when he does go over to London, end up living across the road from the <laughs> <laughs> The next part of that case was that salaries is what you should leave for. There's going to be a bigger paycheck in Ireland, there's going to be a bigger paycheck in Australia. 
Firstly, living expenses are substantially greater in those places according to those large paychecks because there's more competition for those goods that people prize. Also, Australia is very much on the brink of a resource crisis right now. That's why Mr. Chair indicated that 20,000 people are likely to move back to this land of milk and honey in the next couple of years, right? And also, as far as like white, uh, white shoe law firms go in New York, three of those close in as many years, and the other half cut half their staff, Mr. Speaker. So it's not as though we're going to have those fantastic opportunities which are sticking around all the time over there. The world is changing, the economy is diversifying. You can achieve a lot of the things that people like Key et al. achieved if you do operate from an apartment on Little Street because we have the internet. <laughs> He also wanted to claim that there's fantastic opportunities that you just can't access in this fair land, right? But it doesn't work like the idea, it doesn't work the way in which Josh intended it. It's not as though you go over to Silicon Valley and because you're around all of the entrepreneurs and techno wizards, all of a sudden you start Google, right? It doesn't happen like that. <laughs> Finally, he said, there's also a moral case that you should go away, you should collect all that human capital, you should develop your skills, you should do an MBA program. Worth us. <laughs> all of that fantastic knowledge and stuff back to this country, right? But we also have right here a world-class education system that doesn't suffer from so many of those structural problems that, over, that, that exist overseas. They should know they go to one of the best universities in the world, outranked only by Victoria in terms of law. <laughs> okay. I want to talk about these three things I indicated at the start. First of all, what's this moral case I'm talking about? I think it's important that we consider not so much as a controlling factor when we make this decision, but an important consideration for ourselves when we're plotting our future is to ask what we might owe to New Zealand. Because Josh said there's no moral claim at all that this community holds over us. And we said that there probably isn't. They can't demand that we stay behind. They can't clip our wings. But the community has invested in the success of the poor people who are at the front this evening, right? We had a strong public education system that lifted us up and made us operate in relatively a functioning meritocracy. We had primary school, we had intermediate school and high school, and we've had well-funded tertiary education right the way through. The community gave that to us. We've had a public health care system, which means that we've avoided all sorts of horrible illness that we might have suffered had we been in a place somewhat less caring. We've benefited from the cultural capital of an incredibly diverse and multicultural society that has been interested in fostering that kind of diversity and sharing those kind of cultural treasures from all across the world and from back home with us, which has made us into the people that we are today. What that means is we think there is a strong moral case to say that when we try to make this decision, we consider, could consider the possibility that we should reinvest ourselves, the product of that community, back into that community and continue that project, which is making New Zealand a fantastic place to live that lifts everybody up. Moreover, there's plenty of things that we're yet to achieve back here at home, right? There are great challenges for people who want to try and cut their teeth at the hardest work. We've got plenty of social ills. We need to overcome poverty and increase, increase the living standard for all in this country. We need to solve the problem of overcatching of recreational snapper. We need to uh, close the gap with Australia and fix the GSB as of last night. GCSB funding. We need the best people to do that, and the best people are produced in this country. The problem is that they go overseas. But now I want to look at why the character of opportunities is best here, and why people should stay, even if opportunities is their greatest focus. The first thing to say about this is that this special type of, of uh, I guess, like nimbleness to the economy and to the opportunities which exist in New Zealand. It's incredibly easy to get your startup going. It's only like $163 to register a company which you could use for doing legitimate business or money laundering, it seems. <laughs> There's excellent human capital in this country as well. We have an excess of underemployed humanities graduates. I know plenty of them myself. I'm just really keen to get involved in your startup ladies and gentlemen. The point is, it's really easy here to find your niche and take off in a way which is just not around the rest of the world. And when you do take off, you have substantially more autonomy in the kind of decisions and the kind of business or the kind of pursuits that you're going to be doing. You're not going to be a frustrated middle manager at Coca-Cola over there in the United States, right? There is an opportunity that you could be making executive decisions yourself when you're running your small to medium enterprise. And we think that makes for a much more contented life. But finally, there are things to say about this. That there are just some things that we are at the best at. Um, like daring, for instance, apart from our own von terrorist of late. And Weta and Mr. Jackson is, in, is indicative of a man who decided instead of taking his business overseas, he would bring the business here. And he's trained a generation of 
New Zealanders that help participate in that fantastic industry. Roth Drury and Zero, and in terms of sporting and the like, you know, we've got characters uh, who are fantastic rowing, and we can win the World Cup. We can't do that from another country. It would seem you know which World Cup I'm talking about. So there are plenty of opportunities here. And the final thing to say about this is there is just a fantastic lifestyle that you cannot access elsewhere in the world. Sometimes I'm wandering around and I bump into people on the street who can't avoid it like that. Sometimes that's a social ill, sometimes it's a social good. But I was speaking to somebody on Skype, a friend in London at the She's employed at one of the best architectural studios there. She's just scraping by, she can't afford food basically, and she lives on coffee and cigarettes. And she said to me, this is one of the loneliest places in the world. I'm doing what I love, but I miss everybody that I know. She's not living across the road from this Sad. joining the tens of thousands of New Zealanders who made their way to London to try and exploit some of the better opportunities they can find over there. To be honest, I'm probably never going to make it from a philosophy major and you know, end up in a bar rather than one of the magic circle firms that Josh wants to talk about. But if we make this debate about Josh and they've underestimated him as hell, so <laughs> <laughs> I think that Josh would have a much better time over there. And to be honest, I'd give anything to be struggling in an architectural firm in London struggling to fulfill some of the uh, most exciting, cutting-edge stuff that happens overseas when you have a bigger market. Some of the stuff that happens overseas when you have bigger companies. I'd much prefer to be there than in a flat in Aro Street uh, designing uh, more of it, some of the most boring architecture you can imagine over here. I think that this debate is about three things. Let's talk about opportunities, I want to talk about experience, and I want to talk about New Zealand, whether we should stay here, or whether we should go, in terms of uh, the principles I want to talk about. In terms of opportunities, we told you being ambitious shouldn't be an ugly word, it shouldn't be a bad thing, and you should be able to build your career and access a better salary. And even though the living expenses overseas might be higher, we think that the salaries are often that much higher to justify that. We think that one of the key opportunities are the fact that you can advance. The fact that you can be a frustrated middle manager at Coca-Cola means you are a manager at a business which is far, far larger than anything we have here. And if you want to get to that kind of position, you're not going to stay and try and manage like Charlie's Juice in New Zealand. You're going to have to go overseas to go uh, and be a middle manager at Coca-Cola. You have to go overseas to get those bigger companies that end up operating here anyway. If you want to be uh, the top of a multinational, if you want to be the top of a bank that operates in New Zealand, you're probably going to have to move to Australia because the head of ANZ is probably not going to live in Wellington. We think, furthermore, it's not so simple as to say that you just want to start Google. We don't are suspicious of your like, coding talents and whatnot. But the fact is, even though we have the internet, the fact that so many people live in Silicon Valley and so many of the most popular and successful apps come out there has some kind of reason behind it. It's a proximity to people with exciting ideas. It's a proximity to funding. The fact that there are people waiting around the corner to throw money at your application, which is not going to happen when you're living in, in Wellington. And we just don't think you can send an email to Apple and say, hey guys, please check out my awesome app. I live in like some kind of Wellington apartment and run it from this office. Because it's going to go straight to this damn folder. We think we've got to be in a place where it's happening. And yes, we are world leaders in dairy farming and things like that. But that's come up off the table for most of us. I don't think I'm going to carve out a career milking cows up in the heartland. And I don't think I'm going to carve out a career rowing either. We're the best in certain <laughs> things. But a lot of those are things that are off the table for me and off the table for all of us. If you want to get a real good opportunity, then you need to go overseas. In terms of experience, we told you we were a small, isolated, and young country. We think you really enrich your life by getting overseas. Because you can't just point to someone in black frame glasses and tight black jeans on Cuba Street and say we've got uh, some kind of <laughs> say we've got some kind of distinctive culture here. Because there's something that's so much richer and uh, overseas. Um, and we think that actually being there and being able to experience that style of life is important. And of course you can travel, and of course we hope they let you travel. But there's a fact that the style of life and just living overseas and getting to know locals means that you don't wander around, take photos of West Minister and then jump on the plane home. You get to know what it's like living in England, and that's the kind of experience we think that people should aspire to. That's something you should aspire to if you're ambitious. It enriches your life, and it's something that tends to be really important. And yes, you might not end up living over the road from Westminster, but you might underestimate Josh on that point, up on that point. I think he probably will eventually. But even then, you're still close to the action. 
If you're in a flat in Hackney, you might be far away from this uh, financial, like seeming like you're far away from this uh, financial centre of London, but you're in one of the absolute cultural centres. You're seeing all sorts of new ideas all the time, and for the kind of ideas we don't get over here, the kind of diversity and range of experience that isn't like, accessible in New Zealand. There are all parts of the OVC uh, of, uh, experiences which we think people can access, and that's something you should really concern. In terms of New Zealand itself, we think there's a kind of obligation to stay here. The fact that you've been invested in by all sorts of people uh, and you've been invested in by the government. We think being born here ought not mean you feel like you have to stay. You never, you never necessarily ask to be invested in by everybody else. And this is your life. We think you get one life and you should aim to have the best and most interesting life you can. We think that if we all pursue our own interests in that respect, we'll all end up happier if we can go overseas and live there uh, and have a great time. But anyway, we think that even if that's not true, New Zealand's better off than people here overseas. Because the fact is that expats remain tied to New Zealand. Expats keep Skyping their friends like Asher, and expats spread out all across the globe. And in a globalised world, it's really important that we have these kind of networks, that we have webs overseas, because the people who stay behind benefit from that. Because if you need to do a deal in London, and you don't know anybody there, it's incredibly hard. But at the point where there's tens of thousands of New Zealanders, even if they're middle managers at Coca-Cola, or they're starting small companies overseas, we think that gives you good old-fashioned contacts, which, uh, which we don't think the, like, nearly just having the internet pipelines can give you. We think it means that if you want to export out there, if we have a small country that wants to make uh, interesting companies and interesting products, and live off the fact that we sell those to the world, Having New Zealanders over there to help us make those contracts is always going to be really important. So you're, you're, making, uh, you're helping out New Zealand businesses, you're helping out uh, New Zealand in that sense. And even where the workshop itself took a New Zealander to champion it, a New Zealander who went over abroad to Hollywood to make some movies and sell some movies and then film them here, meant that uh, meant where the workshop was able to get the access to that kind of industry that they wouldn't have. Because where the workshop can't just send an email to Steven Spielberg and go, hey guys, we're on the uh, like, opposite side of the world, please consider us. It takes the context to really get those businesses going and give them access to these kind of markets. And that's something that means that New Zealand is better off once we start spreading out across the world. But the fact is, again, most people return. So most people return to have kids here. It's safe. It's a great place to raise kids. It's a bit boring, but you know, toddlers don't really mind about that. <laughs> they for those kind of things. And what do these people bring back? Well, they bring back all the experience they had running companies overseas. And that's why most business leaders didn't, like, uh, in New Zealand didn't rise up to the head of a small, uh, small or medium-sized company here, but went overseas and got the training and got the opportunities and got the exposure to all of the kind of uh, like practices and the, all the kind of new ideas that they're exploring over the seas and the idea of different ways of doing things. So when people come back, they're at the cutting edge. They've been enriched for it and they enrich us for it. Because it's even worse if we stay with a special character. It's even worse if we stay a safe and constructive society that people haven't left. We think that people travelling overseas and forming those networks does actually enrich us, and that's why the ambitious people should do that. So essentially what Josh and Paul wanted to tell you today is that you should go overseas, you should get all of the opportunities and experience overseas, and then you should come back to New Zealand and be great in your field. Well, we think that didn't exactly work out for David Shearer, right? Next minute, he's not going to be the Prime Minister of New Zealand. We think that, in fact, people who stay with New Zealand and reinvest themselves in that culture are much better able to access the kind of opportunities that we have in New Zealand and are much better able to do things like become the great, great Prime Minister or do whatever they want to do at the top of their field. Three things that I want to talk about today. First, I want to talk to you about why it is that we think that you should, in fact, stay in New Zealand and why it is we think you do have an opportunity obligation to that country. Because essentially what they wanted to say is ambition is not a dirty word. And we agree, it's not a dirty word. But the question is what should you be ambitious for? Should you be ambitious to be the type of person who like sits alone in your bedroom at night counting your money and thinking to yourself, oh man, you know, I'm it. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the person who's got all the money. Like we think that you shouldn't. We think that you should be trying to reinvest yourself back into the kind of community that gave you the opportunity to do that. The community that said that you could have free and good education both at primary and at tertiary level. Because the reality is, if you live in a country like Canada or America, you can't access that kind of tertiary level education. What did they tell you then? They told you, well, in fact, we think you have to go overseas to get all those contacts that are really, really good for New Zealand. Because there's just no other way that we're able to meet people overseas. The internet, it just can't do that. You can't 
Skype people and talk to them and make new contacts. Well, even if that's true, and we don't think it is, we're perfectly happy for them to come to us, as they do in quite a wide variety of areas, right? When Peter Jackson said to the rest of the world, no, you have to come to New Zealand to make these films. And we think he was perfectly able to do that without leaving, because he could do things like, I don't know, call people over the phone. That's generally how it works, and in terms of these kinds of things. The second thing I want to talk about in terms of this is the character of opportunity that you get in New Zealand. Because the first thing that we wanted to say is that we think there's a lot of opportunities that you get within New Zealand that you don't get overseas. Because there's simply just too many other people out there competing and vying for exactly the same opportunity, right? That's why when Josh moves overseas, he might not get a job in terms of a law firm. Because although he might end up being like the next Bob Jones, the pillar of New Zealand community, over there, he's going to be like just some, you know, person sitting alone in his room, unable to find a job. The second thing they told you was that, well, people need to go to places like Silicon Valley because that's the only way that they can, you know, break into those kind of industries. That's exactly the kind of thing that people said about the LA music scene. Right? And then Justin Bieber got on YouTube and they did a perfectly good job of saying to people, actually, I have a skill and that there's the internet that can help me to see that. In fact, we think it's far easier when you live in the kind of community where there are people out there who want to give money to entrepreneurs and there's only a hundred people with good ideas instead of like a thousand people out there trying to crowd you up and constantly saying, my idea is better than yours. So we think that's far better. In terms of autonomy, we think it's actually really bad that people go overseas and become like a middle manager at like Coca-Cola. When instead we think it's great if they do want to be like the top tier manager at Charlie's Juice. They can make all the decisions, right? They get to choose where they like go on a holiday. If they're a middle manager, they're probably just like stressing it out every single day in the work office, never able to make any decisions. Like we don't think that kind of decision making is actually very good for you at all. The final thing we told you in terms of opportunities is there's just all of these things that we are the best people in the world at. And Paul, Paul wanted to respond to this by saying, well, like, some people are locked out of those kinds of opportunities. If you're not an amazing sports player, you obviously can't win the World Cup and all those kinds of things. But the point is, when you live in New Zealand, when you invest in that kind of culture, you get to share in all the successes that those people have, right? You get to enjoy being the people who win the World Cup instead of being a Kiwi who's, like, living overseas in some city who has to, like, cling to the only other Kiwis that there are there and, like, try and find a bar that will show the Rugby World Cup because you live in Europe and everybody wants to watch soccer. We don't think that kind of thing is what makes people happy and what, ma what makes people contented. And we think that's something that we should care a lot about. And that's the final thing that we wanted to tell you about, about why it is, is in fact such a great lifestyle choice to live in New Zealand. Because there's nowhere else in the world where you can live in Wellington, walk to work every day, go to the beach on the weekend, drive over to the Wairapa and like taste the best wine in the world, right? When you move overseas, you're probably going to be living in some crummy little flat that takes two hours to drive into London City. And it might be nice to say that I could have camped outside the hospital while Kate Middleton was in there pregnant having her baby, because really, truly, I would have loved that. But I'm probably not going to be doing that. You can't do things like that because you can't afford to. You're always at work and you can never afford to take out those kinds of opportunities. Whereas when you're in New Zealand, we're the kind of country where the former Governor-General and Nan Sachinan walks around on the bus, like on his iPad, talking to people in the community, where you can go to a pool party at Kim.com's house. Like, those kinds of opportunities are just the kind of opportunities that you're never going to get overseas. Because maybe all of those exciting things happen overseas, but the thing to talk about here is that New Zealand always ranks very highly in terms of political and social factors of contentment, right? We we'll always have great trust for our neighbours. We're always very happy about the kind of society that we live in. And it might be that we don't earn as much money. Those things make you far, far happier as an individual and far more likely to enjoy your life. And that's why it's really bizarre that they wanted to tell you, go overseas and make your money and then come back and have your kids here, right? Because that's the kind of thing that's important to you. Community, security, and family. And we think that that is the kind of thing that aren't just for like toddlers because they're boring and lame. They're actually for people who want to like make their lives into something that's meaningful and make themselves happy every day rather than sit down and sacrifice part of their life to sit at home alone in their room and count up their money. <laughs> On our side of the house you get everything, right? You get beaches, you get good wine, you get great New Zealand drinking buddies and you also get the opportunities. On that side of the house you get living in a crummy flat in London just so you can try and stand outside the gates to wait for the announcement of the royal baby. We're happy to oppose. <laughs>
Listen, this guy's really had two basic examples. One was that Spain was a bigger and better version of Cuba Street, probably not true. And secondly, that London was a fantastic place to go. And I want to submit to you now that it kind of seems at the end of this debate that it's been one which invokes a substantial amount of colonial cringe. The idea that once we finish studying our Bachelor of Arts or Gauls or whatever here, we up and we leave back to the motherland and we go and cut our teeth there because that's where the important things are happening. This place is boring. There's nothing to do here. There's no challenges to overcome. We don't buy that, right? Because we think that over generations at this small place at the bottom of the world, we have learned and decided that actually things happen here. It's more important to stick together and stick around and fight it out together rather than chanting rule Britannia, rule Britannia. <laughs> Three things then. Let's talk about experience. Because it seems as though it was a fantastic idea to go and experience what it's like to live as an expat in London, right? And you live in your crummy little flat and you'd be able to get the real vibe from the place. Well, I'll tell you what, I live in a really crummy flat in Aro Valley and I can tell you all about impoverished life and what it's like to go without spaghetti for a week. <laughs> The Holy Land of Australia, I have an expat friend who's just moved over there to try it out in Melbourne, and he tells me how the Kiwis live there. They all live in a big 10 person flat together, and they travel around in a pack, right? <laughs> but it's not so great. It's not the diaspora integrating with all of the connections and fantastic opportunities over there. It's much, a much. But then let's talk about opportunities, because we were told that you need to go to LA to make a film. You need to go to LA to learn how to be a fantastic singer or to release your records, right? Well, we heard that, and then somehow, perhaps unfortunately, they found Justin Bieber on YouTube, and he became famous that way rather than through the traditional route. That stands for a bigger point, is that the world is changing, and it's not just about these hubs around the world. You need to go to New York, you need to go to London, you need to go to Paris to make it. You can do it anywhere. The change is rather than pursuing other people's goals for yourself, you need to stand the ground here and say, this is where I'm going to start. And there are big challenges that we want to do that we want to here. And it's substantially less cutthroat in terms of business because we contend that we have a different kind of attitude. It is about togetherness, it is about community. And people say that's a kind of tall poppy syndrome situation where we cut one another down and don't celebrate success. It's not that though. It's a kind of humbleness and a kind of respect for those who just stick into it and keep going. We think that's a special place to live in which believes in those kind of values. And we told you there are some things which we are simply the best at in the world. And yes, I'm never going to be a rugby player, but I share in the bask, I bask in their glory sometimes. But we are, for instance, one of the best producers of accounting software of late. And we do make some of the biggest films in the world. And those stand for a bigger idea. The idea that Peter Jackson didn't have to go over to LA and knock on someone's door in Hollywood and say, hey guys, I'm really good at directing. He stayed here and he made some fantastic films early on in his career. He built his corpus here and he built a community of competent people that he could trust and he could work with. And then when the time came, he brought the business back to New Zealand and did it better than they could do it the old way back in Hollywood. That's what we call achieve in this place. But the final thing to say is that what it's like to live here is unlike living anywhere else in the world. It's a small place, but that's a fantastic thing. It means, for instance, you're never far from a beach, even if they may be only 60% pure. It means you can walk to work if you don't live in Auckland. And there is a fantastic political and social climate that you just don't experience elsewhere in the world. I think we have a strong sense of community and a belief in the dignity of others than you'll experience in many other countries around the globe. That's something that changes if our best and brightest go on the seas. And so when we're thinking later on this evening whether or not we're going to pack up our bags and move to London to start the next big thing, perhaps we can consider that it might start here instead. I've got a message for Asher and Jody, and that's that the brain drain already happens in New Zealand. Because if you're young and ambitious and want to create wealth, move to Auckland. If you're really young and ambitious and want to create even more wealth, go overseas. But if you're Asher, uh, there's always a civil service job for you here in Wellington. <laughs> we say the debate is about, should the junior doctor, the junior lawyer, stay here and learn a fraction of their salary? Or should they better their lot overseas? Should the trendy, ambitious sociology major sit outside the, the bucket fountain on Cuba Street, or should they go to Spain and experience a totally new culture? The decision is obvious. If you're young and ambitious, go overseas.
overseas. The opportunities for you are a lot better. Let's talk first about money. Because we made some good points here. We said the best and brilliance of an industry is usually centered somewhere around a hub. Because there's a difference between Willow Street and Wall Street, right? You go overseas and ask people which they know, and they'll know one. But one with all the money, where all the people who make the money and drive the economy live, and one which is a back street in some backwater country in Wellington. We say that, that you know, when it comes to Silicon Valley, Angry Birds and Candy Crush were not designed by Jody and Asher in their Willow Street apartment. They were designed in the San Francisco Bay in Silicon Valley. Why is that? Because no random, no person who's a big funder of, of apps is going to take a call from some random in Napier, New Zealand about funding this new app they've got, right? They need someone to vouch for them. Someone who's worked in the industry, who's a leading part of that part of, of, of the economy. We said that is why, for instance, right, they said Justin Bieber. Justin Bieber was found on the internet. The internet's so great, right? People would find Ben Lummis on the internet, right? Why has Ben Lummis not done so well? Because he's a random New Zealand. He can't, he's not, like, he'll never appeal to the international audience that, that Justin Bieber can. Someone who is from that and understands that environment and will appeal to that economy. So the point about meeting people online, there's a difference between making an enormous economic impact and going on a dog friend finder or match on home. Right? If you're going to go online to try, um, to try and succeed, it's not going to work when it's your reputation on the line, when you have to show that you have the credibility and skills to drive something forward, and they just didn't understand that. And about the middle manager at Coca-Cola, that person is making enormous decisions about millions of dollars, right? The Charlie CEO is deciding whether or not to sell in, in Shell or BP. Should we start the Fijoa Frenzy smoothie? Should, should we sponsor the Dargaville rugby team? Like, the point is that the CEO, the CEO of Charlie's is probably better off having been a middle manager at Coca-Cola. And sorry, I didn't realize that Ash's friends who would sit in their underwear at Skype and in London were the paragon of ambitious New Zealanders. We say that if you want to do well, right, if you're a New Zealander who's got the skills, you'll probably get a job. Because, you know, being a New Zealand doctor is kind of similar to being a, a London doctor. We say that people like that who can show they have something to offer will be higher and their life will be better and they'll come back with more money and have the family they want. And yes, it is nice to have nice beaches and it is nice to have great wildlife. But when you've had that for 22 years as I have, sometimes you want something a little bit different than the wilderness of nothing. We say that decision is a legitimate one to make and one that people should make. Communities. It's nice to meet an inception and on a bus. We say that's great if you want that to stay in New Zealand. You're a little bit more ambitious. <laughs> of course, some people end up in crummy flats. Of course, some people won't get employed. But if you are actually the top of the top of New Zealand, you're the upcoming Wall Street banker, you're the person who's the top of your game, you will be employed and your life will be a lot better. So move. Thank you very much. Magnificent debate, and I'd now like to ask the adjudicators uh, to retire and uh, make your verdict and remind you that uh, you are deciding on both the winner of the debate and the best speaker of the evening. Um, so, if I could ask our um, uh, debaters to uh, grab a seat up front here, I'll invite our panelists up um, Stephen, Stephen Franks and um, uh, the Minister, the Honourable Peggy Abrata. Um, what we'll do is, uh, so our panellists will give their reflections that are no doubt brilliant and incisive and erudite, and they'll speak for up to five minutes, uh, and then we'll have a, a, a few minutes afterwards for uh, any questions that anyone uh, may have. So, Steve. I really enjoyed uh, being advised to reflect. Uh, I want to start sound mentally um, grandfatherly, but it did remind me a lot of the expectations, a lot of the claims about what going overseas does for you and doesn't do for you. Uh, obviously, the most eternal, they sound very similar to what it was when you went overseas, and of course it was too expensive to call home, so you didn't actually talk to anyone at home for two years. But you did send aerograms and uh, letters, and they went to post a response when they replied, which none of you very few will know what that means, but it was actually that you got your connections with home by calling at a post office where they thought you might be, 
and the clerk going through a whole lot of little shelves and, and fishing through piles and piles of mail in case there was something waiting for you there at post for stop. I mention that because I uh, was inclined, I, I'm glad I'm not adjudicating because I was listening to the substance and I like these debates that aren't just um, um, celebrity debates where you're actually debating a, a serious topic. I was looking to see whether I could form a view on um, whether there is a duty of loyalty or whether there should be an onus to give it a go at, at making your career or your life here, uh, whether we should feel rightly a little bit that people who go and say they might stay away from here are a little bit traitorous, and whether that sort of instinct is just personal or widely shared. As it turned out, um, I, I think the, the reflection is probably very, very similar, reassuringly similar to what it was 30, 40 years ago, and probably almost unique to New Zealand in the sense that there are some countries where it would be a ludicrous question to say, stay, I owe it to my country, and others where it would be ludicrous not to feel that. I'm sure for Japanese, for example, that sense of duty to uh, you and your sense of being a part of, of a whole and incomplete without is dominating. But I was also reminded, too, by what the affirmative said, um, that we have dropped our ambition a lot over the last 30 years. I don't think we had much doubt at all when we went on the that we would end up at the top of whatever heap we went to. I think, in fact, some people didn't come home because they were embarrassed to admit that it hadn't been fantastic. But by and large, it wasn't a question of going to sit at the feet of the master. It was a question of allowing them to have a bit of our precious time while we had fun at their expense. And I think, in a sense, there's a little bit more undue uh, humility now, possibly in the country as a whole, in the sense that um, we, in, in, my, in my early career, uh, we developed a corporatisation model which the World Bank asked us to go over there and teach them how to do it and wrote their manual. And it didn't seem surprising to us. Our fisheries um, regime it was world leading, and we have the best fisheries management in the world. At the time we were doing it, in the early 90s, it didn't seem odd that that was being developed here. It didn't seem odd that Tyler Cohen and uh, other people who are now world names came to New Zealand not only to speak uh, to us but to learn from us. It didn't seem odd that I was invited to, as a humble Wellington lawyer to go to Chicago University where I lunched most days with two or three Nobel Prize winners because you sort of knew that the stuff we were doing, that the New Zealand Treasury and the New Zealand Reserve Bank and New Zealand generally was cutting edge. And I'm a bit sort of concerned about the thrust of some of the discussion here that says you go away to, uh, to try and hack it with the masters and then you come back here to have the kids and go to the beach, especially from Wellington where I never thought of the beach as our <laughs> main attraction. So I just urge that when we consider it, that we raise our sights. And I'm reminded that people forget um, London in Shakespeare's time um, probably had less than 5,000 people who were literate. And then Milton was writing, it might have been 15,000. And when the learner men up in Newcastle, not even in London, that, that uh, um, the United Kingdom might have had uh, 9, 000, 9 million people in total, and they invented things like the railway engine, and Adam Smith started to understand economics, and you had a, a Locke and Hume and the other intellectual masters, they were working in a society much smaller than New Zealand's, and they were able to derive enough challenge from each other to change their world. And so I just say there's many things that, uh, a lot of reflection, I took down far too many notes and I've gone forever, but um, one of the is to, um, you can find centres of excellence of sufficient size in most ideas to really take off in almost any size centre if you're ambitious enough. And I think we may not recognise right now just what the academy, the entrepreneurial academy is producing in Wellington. Uh, it's, it's Morgan and Drury and Jackson. They 
are spinning off from them other people who've seen how you go about it, how you do it, and there are businesses that I can think of right now that are probably going to be made every bit as big as theirs, simply because of that example of a small concentration of people who've got the confidence and the ambition to kick off. In other words, I probably fall uh, out of inclination into the camp of the negative, um, but I liked the, the uh, affirmatives uh, challenge to get out there and, and hack it. I just say, go there with a bit more chutzpah. Or, 
all cope. Um, we are a country of four and a half million people, and one of the major distinctions as a result of that is everyone does count. I mean, you can watch television and you know possibly know who that person is on television. Yeah, um, we we run into people on the street all the time, and they are generally people who have come and gone from other parts of the world. And this is one of the opportunities we have as a country. We're an intimate, small country, and that carries with it both both positives and negatives. The great thing is, of course, that we all of us are descendants of great navigators, of adventurers, of people who thought there was something better out beyond that horizon, and therefore we do have the genes in us of being travellers and being courageous and moving beyond what other people tell us should be our limits. We're a limitless people and we are lucky to be citizens of Aotearoa of New Zealand. Um, when we talk about whether it's Cuba Street or um, Spain and the experience of culture, actually I can tell you right now that you get a very different <coughs> cultural experience in Rotoria and Ruatapana <laughs> as you might get from Gore or Gisborne. There's a lot of that here in New Zealand. But the point about being a New Zealander is that we don't have to be either or people. We can be and and people. And one of the fabulous things about having a really top class education system, which we do have, is that we create the possibility of choice. The choice to be here, to be there, to come and go, and then whatever we're doing, build the economic, social and cultural capital, not only of who we are as citizens, but who we are as a country. I think we are profoundly fortunate to be New Zealanders, to come along and hear four young and ambitious people talk about their ideas of what's possible for themselves and for our country. And so it's been a great pleasure to be here this, this evening. And I can tell you about accessibility. I get people coming up to me all the time saying, oh my God, you're that wonderful Minister of Education. I'm a teacher and I love you. <laughs>
logic and colonial courage and constantly being proud that we've, quote, grown up or that we're defining our culture, which I think is a bit of an elite cultural uh, preoccupation. And on the other hand, genuinely welcoming the fact that in a small country you're looking outside and you can actually bump into and constantly be confronted by differences. We are remote, but intellectually we draw from all over the place. Whereas if you're in a big country, you unavoidably, it's media and it's pretty preoccupied on its own issues, and particularly centers and empires or whatever. And I am concerned that we have a sort of um, cultural ethnic cleansing at the moment that is matched by planting the town with only native trees, when in fact it would be far better to have deciduous trees with a bit more light in the winter and not so scary for women walking through in the, in, the, in the daytime. There's a whole lot of things which to me would be much better if we unrationally said we're going to fuck the best of whatever we see than we're at. And that will be New Zealand, not um, staunchly sort of struck and, and, and resisting uh, foreign influence or feeling that it's part of New Zealand is to claim that we're better than everyone else or something. I want us to be proud, but um, not, not smug. And quite a lot of our cultural reaction, the cultural definition at the moment, is very much defining ourselves by who we're not. Um, I would much prefer us to be the people who could play at any role, who can speak to anyone in the same way that when I went to my OE, one of the neat things was being classless in a classroom society. That you could slot in almost anywhere because you weren't part of their class as a structure. And I'd like to think we could do that, as you say, in Shanghai. Um, walk with a small enough stick that we don't automatically cause people to bristle, but um, be determined to actually be able to match it. There's a lot of things which we try, we, we've given up trying to match um, quite a few foreigners. We sort of accept. Uh, you know, we will come here and earn less for a start. You know, we it on the grounds that it's a nice lifestyle. It's true, but it doesn't seem to me ambitious enough. Well, hold on. At the risk of now stuffing Spain, I've never needed to define myself like a lot In fact, I think part of the problem is that I constantly get defined by other people's stereotypes. So I don't know whether any of you saw the infamous interview of me on TV3 and how could I be a real Nari if I wasn't standing in the by-election for equal diversity, I wasn't standing for Labour, that I unashamedly embraced wealth, that I could speak Māori but didn't wear a ball. You know, like these are other people's ideas of who a real Māori is. I mean, the general takeaway you could get from that was that I was a fake Māori bitch. I am just, I'm a Ngāti Pro Naikahu woman who wants my children to grow up speaking four, five, six languages, which is what they do without trading or being from Rotoria in New Zealand, but citizens of the world. And as Minister of Education, I want those choices to be available to every New Zealand child and young person. Yeah, Luke, um, there are a couple of things that didn't come through tonight. Um, one was the, the comment by uh, the late Sir Paul Callan about New Zealand being lucky that we live in a civil society. And the second one was national resource capital that New Zealand's got, uh, which, which never came through from any from either side tonight. Would you like to comment on that? Well, yeah. 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 Um, I don't know whether it's derivative or not, but we have a, a view. I think we are very a-religious, but in replacement, because humans always have a worship, urge to worship, we have started to worship a kind of nature vision that minimises human impact. And I think it could end up um, quite pervasive, and our natural resources might not mean much if we've decided that the best way to worship them is to lock them up. Um, I'm also say before I forget that the idea of going away and being a little manager somewhere else and then coming back and running your own business, actually I haven't seen much of that. I actually think that if you're going to run your own business, you start running your own business and that's what you grow, you grow businesses. Little management is good training for running
in someone else's business as a senior manager? Um, on the two parts of your question, uh, your observation about civil society and about the use of natural resources, um, I think in civil society, again, one of the things that I'm interested in, and personally, and as Minister of Education, is not so much um, a development of a discussion of civics within our, our uh, curriculum, but I am much more interested in what I distinguish as the citizenship. Okay? So we have had uh, the phenomenon, I suppose, of the last few years where lots more young people are turning out to ANZAC um, ceremonies and the like, and yet not as many turning out to vote. And so it seems to me that there's a disjunct there because the people who went off to war and fight, all of which were overseas, went off in the service of, you know, albeit not necessarily, um, you know, clearly articulated values of freedom and justice and social equity and egalitarianism and all those things that our country is founded on. I'm really interested in how we extrapolate those that, that we do get an active and vibrant citizenship. I'm very um, motivated by an essay that's out on the Nutter Road uh, when pulling the Māori Battalion together in, in the late 1930s and it was called The Price of Citizenship. You know, and, um, and what it was, we owe it as an obligation to our country and what it is we get from our country. So I'm interested in how we develop that kind of debate and discussion more and how you then practice it. In terms of natural resources, well, um, I've had the opportunity and honour of dealing with both in the last three years. So I was Minister of Energy and Resources and, you know, approved exploration by Petra Brass out in the Rokumara Basin, um, which coincided with being the shores of both my tribe and my husband's. And so for you know, 18 months or so, I had to drive past signs saying, here, here, you're an egg, um, you know, and turning up to, to meetings. That, well, family tweet bursts and the speeches would be about how terrible I was that I was going to bring the Gulf of Mexico, you know, and explosions out here in the ocean. And and then my getting up at the set to say tweet first and saying, well, how many of you walk and rode horses here? You know, and none of them. They're all driven and they're all, you know, taking advantage of the wealth that accrues from the use of natural resources. Now I'm the Minister of Education and the most powerful natural resource we have is the one between our two ears. We are never going to, as a trading small nation, far away across the vast Pacific Ocean, out-procreate our trading nations. But we can out-create, out-innovate, out-smart, out-think. But it relies on an outstanding education and a global vision. I agree entirely with Stephen that we have to continue to do what I think New Zealanders have done very well, which is cherry-pick good ideas from around the world and then indigenise them. And so I do again agree that we must overcome any idea of cultural cringe which suggests we're just so good that we don't need to look further. One of the things I think tonight's debate proved is this is a very good country if you're well off, or even just moderately well off, it's not a particularly great place to live if you are excessively poor and you are broken and downtrodden and depressed uh, and left behind. And it struck me that neither of the teams was able to offer really any prescription beyond their own self sentence particularly on the about how they're actually going to uplift so, so the rest of the community. And I wonder whether in the end the, the elevation of the moderately well-off and the rich is sufficient to make this a really good place. Whether we actually ought to be doing more about what used to be called the young place. I can scarcely criticise you for broadening out and saying that they should have started on a prescription for the social reform, but <laughs> I broadened out the two. But I would have thought that if they had raised that topic, it would have been a very strong um, vote for the the defeat, the, um, the negative, in the sense that of all the places in the world to be relatively poor or poor, this must be one of the easiest. I mean. You're not socially excluded for a start. You, uh, you, you may have much constrained opportunities, but being poor here, I, I don't know whether it still happens on people's RV, but I spent 
my time on the bones of environment and, and the worm's eye view of living in Europe is pretty unpleasant. If you think that the flat in London that was talked about is dreary, imagine a flat in Newcastle. Uh, through, through a winter when you don't see the sun for a long time, for, when you have to pay to go uh, um, to a whole lot of things that are free here. So I, I'd, have, I'd have thought that it's one of our great advantages that you can be poor here, and it's one of our disadvantages. You can be poor here. Lack of ambition is actually pretty easy to sustain. Yeah, and also, yeah. Um, <laughs> to, be fair, to be fair, the characterizations you use are pretty unpalatable for the next country. So, you know, being poor and being depressed and all of those types of things, that's an unhappy condition to be in in any country. Um, but also, I think that it depends on how you define it. For instance, I grew up in a family of 10. Uh, we never once owned our own home or our own car. Uh, we grew a big vegetable garden and, uh, well, actually, to be fair, my father was a teacher and he taught what they called farm training. And so, actually, all the fifth and sixth form boys. Um, <laughs> great star for instance, whether it was you know, the local tennis club or the PTA or whatever, whatever. I now see without turning on my own community, and, um, and I have been quite open about this in my own main speech in Parliament, how much dependency on the government has absolutely um, you know, ripped the guts out of self-reliance. And, and cousins who I went to school with now who grew up in the same situation as me no longer part there. Now, I know this sounds kind of like, but actually farming your own food at home where it can easily be organic because we've just never been able to afford fertiliser to interfere with it. <laughs> and, and now that I'm also a Manuka honey grower and exporter, it's a great thing that we could never afford that. So I think it's a far greater condemnation to have a poverty of spirit, and I know that it's easy to just roll off the tongue. Um, but my, I, I work for David Longing for some time in, in his advisory group, and, um, and I used to go home, but I'd come back. He finally said to me, I think I'm going to cancel your leaves. And I said, why is that? And he said, you go home, boy, with all the policy we make, <laughs> then you come back bitter and dark about the effect that it's having <laughs> on actual people, you know. Um, and so, so yeah, I, I mean, I'm not suggesting that New Zealand is perfect, but I agree with Stephen having actually also done, just one final story, I have done work in Central and Eastern Europe, and I have come back from that and said to my own relations, you know, stop going on about how aggrieved we all are about blah, 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 and all of that. Our kids are not being sold as sex slaves. They are not having their genitals mutilated. They are not being treated as intellectually handicapped because they speak five languages, but their Romani and not one of those languages is English. You know, there's a lot of sense of proportion we can get, which is another great benefit of going overseas. We could go on, I think uh, I think the debate is probably quite like to hear this one. So thank you very much for that was uh, Stephen and uh, Mr.
Uh, the second is uh, from a sort of altruistic, this is from an Italian altruistic former university debate that we think it's wonderful, uh, the three of us in the debate community, that these organisations are paying for the university debates to go out to the community and show what they do uh, and show the wonderful talents, not only for the four speakers, that's an ideal speakers and the main science have in universities. And so we're very thankful for the support that these organisations offer university debate in that way. And thirdly, as an entirely self-centred uh, point of view, it's great to come along lots of debates tonight as I contemplate growing my suit of white shoes uh, as a 29-year-old and decide where I want to go to New York or, or, or some start to decide if I want to uh, do the OAE or, or stay behind. The second thank you is to thank all speakers um, tonight. I think they all deserve another round of applause.